Hello, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Welcome. I'm Brother Paul from the Fellowship of the Spirit. Reading today is our brother David. And the precept that we are going to address, we're going to piggyback on last night a little bit. Faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. It is impossible to show what you believe in or to prove what you believe in without doing the works to, to show that belief. If I walk into a room and I believe that if I walk in a dark room, if I believe that when I flip the light switch on, the light's going to come on in that room, that's great. I believe it. But I don't show that belief until I go and hit the switch and the light comes on. Whether the light comes on or not, I showed the belief that I believe the light will come on by doing the work of flipping the switch. So my belief or my faith, because we're going to show you faith is belief, is proven by my works or made perfect by my works. I walk in a dark room, I have faith or belief that I can switch the light switch on and not fall all over the furniture when I'm walking. I hit the switch, the light goes on, I can go ahead and maneuver through the room. My faith was made perfect by my works. My belief was shown by my works. So faith without works is dead. We're going to show you what God says, how you're supposed to show your faith in him. And we're going to start this off with a very important scripture. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to define what sin is. Let's go to 1 John, the third chapter. Without defining sin and showing what sin is, this whole lesson will go right over our heads. Because what is it that we're working to do if we don't know what sin is? Sin is not drinking. Sin is not dancing. It's not staying out late at night and all kinds of other crazy foolish things that man has come up with. Let's read God's definition of sin. First John, the third chapter, and brother, one verse, verse four. First John three and verse four, brother. Brother David, whenever you're ready to start this lesson, go ahead. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. Whosoever commits sin transgresses or breaks the law, because sin is the breaking or transgressing of God's commandments. That is God's definition of sin, the breaking of his commandments. Let's continue. Let's go to James, the second chapter. James, the second chapter. James 2. James 2, and let's pick it up at verse 8, brother, 2 and 8. Go ahead. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. And that royal law is the Ten Commandments, or it starts with the Ten Commandments. Go ahead, brother. But if ye have respect to persons, ye commit sin, and are convicted of the law as a transgressor. So if you have a respect of persons, you treat someone differently than someone else because you like them better, they're your family, they're your friends, or whatever the case might be. You are convicted as a sinner because you're not loving your neighbor as yourself. Go ahead, brother. For whosoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. And you can keep the whole law, but if you break one, you're guilty of all of them. And yes, it's impossible to keep every one of God's laws perfectly. So let's get that out of the way right now. But that's not what it's talking about. That's not what it's talking about. Because the laws that pertain to you, you can be perfect in them. And we'll deal with that a little later. Go ahead, brother. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So if you offend in one point or in one area of the Ten Commandments, you're guilty of all. But we're going to show you how we get out from under that death sentence as we continue. Let's go to Proverbs, the 29th chapter, brother. Proverbs, the 29th chapter. Proverbs 29. Proverbs 29. And brother, we're going to pick it up at verse 22. 29 and verse 22. Go ahead. An angry man stirreth up strife, and a furious man aboundeth in transgression. Uh -huh. A man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. So an angry man uh, stirreth up strife, but a furious man aboundeth in sin. Because when you're angry, you're not thinking. You're not thinking of anything except a 
appeasing that anger or revenging, avenging whatever it is that's making you angry. Taking care of that situation through fury and wrath. You're not thinking soundly. You're not taking a step back and thinking how anyone could solve the situation. You're just bounding in your fury. And when you're doing that, you're sitting. A man's pride shall bring him low. What is making you so angry that you're so furious? Your pride has been hurt. Prisons are filled with, pe with people that have had their pride rubbed the wrong way. He talked to me this way. She did this to me. Oh, they didn't realize who they were talking to. Pride comes before the fall, sisters and brothers. When you're filled with false pride, you're filled with sin. Man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the humble in spirit. The opposite of being a sinner, when you have understanding of God's word, is being humble through the scriptures, being humble through his word. But sin starts with pride, sisters and brothers. Let's continue. Let's go to the 21st chapter of Proverbs. Proverbs 21. Proverbs 21. And we're going to read one verse, verse 4. Pride starts to fall. Without the fall, or without pride, there is no fall most of the time. It's pride is where the fall begins. Pride is what takes you away from the word of the true and living God. 21 and 4, brother, go ahead. And high look in a proud heart, and the plowing of the wicked is sin. And when you have that high look in that proud heart, you're just plowing forward, and you're not concerned with who you're stepping on, who you're hurting. Physically, mentally, material-wise, you want something, you're going and you're stealing it. You're a wicked man, and you're plowing through life. You want somebody's wife, the next-door neighbor's wife, you woo her until she gets away from her husband. You're plowing through the wicked. You're wicked and you're plowing through what? Through life. And that's sin, sisters and brothers. Because what that's doing, you're puffed up with pride. You got that high look. And you're transgressing against the commandments of God. You're breaking his laws, his statutes, and his judgments. So being humble through the word and in the word normally is the opposite of sin. Let's continue. Let's go to Romans, the third chapter. Let's see how we're cleared of guilt. Let's go to Romans, the third chapter. How do we have these sins, this death sentence erased from us? Romans 3. Romans 3. Now that we know what sin is, the breaking of God's commandments, how do we have this erased? 3 and 23, brother, go ahead. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Because we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. So how do we get out of this death sentence for sin? Something has to die for sin. All things are purged by blood, and without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Go ahead, brother. Being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. So we're justified or cleared of guilt freely by God's grace. The redemption that is in Christ Jesus and the Father sending his only son to shed his blood for us so that his blood would purge our sins. Go ahead, brother. Whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through his faith in his blood. So it's through faith in his blood that we are justified freely by his grace. So it's looking like grace and faith are kind of tied together. Go ahead, brother. To declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past. And it's to declare his righteousness, Jesus Christ, for the remissions of sins that are past. Go ahead, brother. Through the forbearance of God. Through the forbearance of God. Let's go ahead to Romans, the fifth chapter. Romans, the fifth chapter. We're going to deal a little bit with grace and with faith. Romans 5. And brother, we're going to pick it up at verse 1. 5 and 1. Go ahead. Therefore, being justified by faith. So we're justified by faith. Wait a minute. I thought we're justified by the shed blood of our Messiah. Well, we are. Our faith in Jesus justifies us. But what is faith? Faith is nothing more than belief. Go ahead, brother. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And then we're at peace. We're reconciled to our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ when we come under that shed blood of Christ Jesus. And we come under that shed blood through faith. Go ahead, brother. By whom... Also, we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So we have 
access by our belief into this grace that we're standing in. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. What is grace? Grace is nothing more than when we sin, God didn't kill us. Grace is that shed blood of Jesus and the opportunity to come under it. That's what that grace is. Just like an employer, you have to work at 7. He says, I'm going to let you come under that 7 o'clock clock in. I'm going to give you till 10 after 7. I'm going to give you that 10-minute grace period. You clock in at 10 minutes after, I'm going to count it like it was 7 o'clock. That's a grace period. God said when man sinned, the day you sin, you're going to die. But God's grace, sending Christ Jesus to give us understanding of how to come back to him so that our faith in Jesus or our belief in the gospel of Christ will give us repentance from the way we are now so we can repent or turn from that and we can have by our belief or faith in Jesus, we can learn how to save ourselves by the gospel he's given us. Then and only then do we come under that shed blood when we repent and we live in the gospel. Are you done with that, brother? Yes. Let's go to Ephesians, the second chapter. Ephesians, the second chapter. Ephesians 2. Ephesians 2. And we're going to pick it up at verse 7, brother. We're going to look a little bit real quick at grace, faith, and works. Ephesians 2 and 7, brother. Go ahead. That in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. So that, that grace, that kindness comes through Christ Jesus to us. And it's not just to us now, but it's to every human being who's ever lived. Without Jesus coming and suffering and dying, Abraham had no shot at salvation. Isaac, Jacob, Israel, Moses, all the prophets, none of them had an opportunity at salvation until Jesus actually came and became that Passover sacrifice. Go ahead and continue, brother. For by grace are you saved through faith. So it's by grace are you saved through your belief. That's what faith is, belief. By grace are you saved through your belief. Go ahead, brother. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. And this grace is a gift of God. We didn't, we didn't earn this gift. Go ahead, brother. Not of works, lest any man should boast. See, it's not about doing any kind of works. We're sinners. We should die. All men have come short of the glory of God. We've all sinned. We should all die. But by God's grace, we have access into this faith or belief, which changes our walk into the walk of what we believe in, the gospel of Christ Jesus. Go ahead, brother. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath set before, well, I'm sorry, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And those good works that we repent to is what, what God ordained before that we should walk in. And it started with those Ten Commandments. Let's continue. Let's go to Romans, the third chapter. Back to Romans 3. Romans 3. We're going to show you that God's covenant of salvation is set through your belief through your belief, which becomes obedience. Romans 3 and verse 29, brother, go ahead. Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. Yes, he's the God of the Gentiles also because it's the commonwealth of Israel. What was given to Israel was good for all nations. Go ahead, brother. Seeing it is one God which shall justify the circumcision by faith and the uncircumcision through faith. Going to justify Israel by faith and all the strangers through faith. What's faith? Belief. Go ahead, brother. Do we then make void the law so through faith? So we, then we make void the law through our belief? God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. God forbid. Yea, we establish the law. Because the law now is our faith. Because the law is the gospel of Christ Jesus. Let's continue. Let's go to Ecclesiastes, the 12th chapter. Ecclesiastes, the 12th chapter. Ecclesiastes 12, and we're going to pick it up at verse 11. So God's covenant of salvation is set through our belief. And when it's by grace that we come in and stand in that belief, and that belief, sisters and brothers, 
was those works that were ordained from the foundation of the world. Let's see what else the Lord said about those works. Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 11, brother, go ahead. The words of the wise are as goats and as nails fastened by the masters of assemblies, which are given from one shepherd. One shepherd, Christ Jesus. We have lessons on the website. We show you. Jesus is the only God man ever dealt with. Exodus, that was Jesus giving the Ten Commandments on the mount. Go ahead, brother. And further, by these, my son, be admonished. Of making many books, there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. you got 66 books of the Bible, sisters and brothers, and you've got plenty of books that are helps, Bible dictionaries, the Strongs, different helps to help you understand the 66 books. The books that God gave us to every language. We don't need any outside lost books and all this other stuff. Those are all weariness to the flesh. You could study these 66 books for 100 years if you lived that long, starting when you were old enough to understand and read, and you won't comprehend everything in these 66 books. So much study is a weariness to the flesh. Not study of God's word, of trying to piece it together in other areas. Go ahead, brother. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Be I'm sorry. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. So the conclusion of the whole matter is to fear God and keep his commandments, because that's what we're going to be judged by at the appointed time. Let's continue. Let's look at what it means to be perfect in the sight of God. Let's go to 1 Chronicles, the 28th chapter. 1 Chronicles, the 28th chapter. I scream the word of God and a branch comes down to emphasize the point. Wow, I thought you just smacked the table. <laughs> First Chronicles 28. And we're going to pick it up in verse 6, brother. First, let's look at Solomon, what he did to be perfect, or what he was told to do to be perfect. First Chronicles 28 and 6, go ahead. And he said unto me, Solomon thy son, he shall build my house and my courts, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. Uh -huh. Moreover, I will establish his kingdom forever, if he be constant to do my commandments and my judgments as at this day. Now David's telling Solomon what Jesus told him to tell Solomon. Go ahead, brother. Now therefore, in the sight of all Israel, the congregation of the Lord, and in the audience of our God, keep and seek for all the commandments of the Lord your God, that ye may possess this good land, and leave it for an inheritance for your children after you forever. Go ahead, brother. And thou, Solomon my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. With a perfect heart and a willing mind. Not adding or taking away from the scriptures, but once the Lord opens your eyes to how to conduct yourself in anything according to them, you do it. Perfect heart, willing mind. Go ahead, brother. For the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all imaginations of thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found of thee. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. All oh, God knows my heart. Yes, he does, sisters and brothers. You better make sure you clean them secret places, and you better make sure your heart's perfect before him. Let's continue. Genesis, the sixth chapter. And the heart is the mind. So God knows all the imaginations and thoughts of the heart? Let's prove that. Let's go to Genesis, the sixth chapter. Let's look at Noah. Let's look at our brother Noah. Genesis 6. Find all the other books. I can't find a sixth chapter in the Bible. Genesis 6, and let's pick it up at verse 5. 6 and 5. Go ahead, brother. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. God knows my heart is a scary place to stand on, a better place to stand. If there's a gray area, lean toward the righteous. Lean toward the righteous and forsake that sinful pleasure that's waiting on the other side. You're not sure on which way to go. What does the scripture say? Well, a lot of people do it this way, but what does the scripture say? Well, the way I do it in my house, well, what does the scripture say? Stick with the scripture, sisters and brothers. Don't add or take away from it. The Lord said that he knew every imagination of, the, of man's heart is only evil and wicked continually. Go ahead, brother. And it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth. And it grieved him at his heart. And because God is the only one that can look into the heart, 
He it repented the Lord that he had made man. It grieved him. He's like, why did I make this worthless being? Go ahead, brother. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from off of the face of the earth, both man and beast and the creeping thing and all the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made this. And the Lord's going to kill everything and everybody. He said, man, I, I should have never done this. I'm sorry for doing this. I'm going to I'm going to repent. I'm going to turn from making all these people and all these beings and everything. I'm just going to kill them all. And he looked around and he saw Noah. Go ahead, brother. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. He was a sinner, but he found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Because the day you sin, you should die, and all have fallen short of the glory of God. But Noah found grace in the eyes of God. In other words, he wasn't wicked like the rest of them. Go ahead, brother. These are the generations of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. And Noah was a just man, and he was perfect in his generations. And Noah walked with God. He was perfect in his generation, sisters and brothers. Let's go see about Abram. Let's go to Genesis, the 17th chapter. Let's see about Abram. Genesis 17. Genesis 17. Just a couple pages. And pick it up at verse 1, brother. 17 and 1. Let's look at how Abram was perfect. Go ahead. And when Abram was 90 years old and 9, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. So now he told Abram, I'm the Almighty God. How you doing? Nice to meet you. If you walk, be I want you to walk before me and I want you to be perfect. Go ahead. And I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And if you do that, I'm going to make a covenant with you. And Abram, I want you to walk before me and be perfect. And if you do, I'm going to make a covenant between me and you. Go ahead, brother. And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be as a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name be any more called Abram. Thy name shall be Abraham. Uh -huh. For the father of many nations have I made thee. Mm. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee, in their generations for an everlasting covenant, to be a God unto thee, and to thee thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee, and to thy seed after thee, the land wherein thou art a stranger, and all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, uh -huh. and I will be their God. Go ahead, brother. And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed after thee, in their generations. So now, he told Abram, If you walk before me perfect, I'm going to make a covenant with you. And all these great nations are going to come out of you and all this. And then later on, he's going to say, and Jesus is going to come out of you and bless the entire world. But that's for another time. Let's go to Deuteronomy, or no, let's go to uh, 2 Timothy, the third chapter. 2 Timothy, the third chapter. We're dealing with being perfect here. 2 Timothy 3. Oh, that was just for the old covenant and the old testament and all that. Let's go to 2 Timothy, the third chapter, because I know somebody's going to come up here and say that sooner or later. They're going to be looking at this lesson and go, ah, and shut it off. That being perfect was Old Testament stuff, Old Covenant stuff. Okay, 2 Timothy, the third chapter. 2 Timothy 3, and we're going to pick it up at verse 15, brother. 3 and 15, go ahead. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, remember, they didn't have a New Testament. They were living it and writing it. So they knew the Holy Scriptures, the Old Testament, the law, book of the covenant. They knew them, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through belief, which is in Christ Jesus. Because he's the one that wrote the book and gave it to him. He's the author and finisher of our faith. He's the one that's known as the Word. And in John, the first chapter, it says that in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And there wasn't anything made that was made unless it was made by him. That was Jesus, our Messiah, the only God man's ever dealt with. Go ahead, brother. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. And all the scriptures were given by God and are profitable, one, for a doctrine, for a way to conduct yourself, for reproof and for correction when you fall off that doctrine, 
and it's for instruction in righteousness in that doctrine, the doctrine of the gospel of Christ Jesus. Go ahead, brother. That the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. That the man of God may be perfect. The man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works because they understand the scriptures. They don't live on false doctrine that God's commandments were nailed to some cross. Let's go to Deuteronomy, the 18th chapter now. Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18. And let's see how it is we're supposed to worship. Deuteronomy 18 and pick it up at verse 9, brother. Go ahead. When thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. So you're not supposed to learn to do after the abominations of the nations. This is at a particular time when Israel was going through and the Lord was taking, taking the nations out of the promised land one by one. But this goes for when Israel was scattered throughout all nations. And this goes for anyone that has faith in Christ Jesus. Jesus himself told you not to worship according to the ways of the other nations or according to traditions of men. He told you not to add or take away from his holy written word. Go ahead and continue, brother. There shall not be found among you any one that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, uh -huh. or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, or a charmer, or a consulter with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. For all these that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. Because of these abominations, the Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. And we could take every one of these abominations and we could bring it into a modern day practice, but that's for another time. Go ahead, brother. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. Thou shalt be perfect with the Lord thy God. We're going to show you next God's definition of perfect. Go ahead, brother. For these nations which thou shalt possess hearkened unto the observers of times and unto diviners, but as for thee, the Lord thy God hath not suffered thee to do so. But as for you, the Lord thy God has not told you to do so. He told you to be perfect in his sight. Let's go to Psalm, the 18th chapter. Let's see what God's definition of perfect is. We rely too much on man's definitions of everything and try to impute it into the word of God. And you can't do that, sisters and brothers. When God said love, he meant love. When God said hate, he meant hate. When God said, but if you do this, you shall live, but if you don't, you shall die, he meant that. But he wasn't always talking about this flesh and blood death. He was talking about the eternal death. Psalm 18, let's look at God's definitions of perfect. Psalm 18 and pick it up at verse 30, brother. Go ahead. As for God, his ways are perfect. His ways are perfect. As for God, his ways are perfect. Go ahead. The word of the Lord is tried. He is a buckler to all those that trust in him. The word of the Lord is tried, and he is a buckler to all those that trust in him. He's your protection, sisters and brothers. Go ahead. For who is God save the Lord? Or who is a rock save our God? Uh -huh. It is God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. It is God that girdeth me with strength and makes my way perfect. And when you become obedient to his word, you'll have strength in his word that you've never experienced before. But that's for another time. Let's look at another definition of perfect. Psalm 101. Psalm 101. Psalm 101. And brother, we're going to pick it up at verse 4. 101 and verse 4. Go ahead, brother. A froward heart shall depart from me. I will not know a wicked person. The Lord says he will not know a wicked person. A froward heart shall depart from me. A forward heart is someone that's filled with sin, since the brothers, and doesn't really care. Go ahead. Whoso privily slandereth his neighbor, him will I cut off. Him that hath an high look and a proud heart, will I not suffer. You're filled with that false pride or any kind of pride. Pride comes before the fall. The Lord says, I'm not going to even entertain this individual. Go ahead. My eyes shall be upon the faithful of the land, that they may dwell with me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve he me. He that walketh in a perfect way, he shall serve me. What's perfect in God's eyes? Keeping his commandments. Let's continue. Let's go to John, the 17th chapter. Gospel of John, the 17th chapter.
John 17, brother, and let's pick it up at verse 14. John 17 and verse 14. Go ahead. I have given them thy word, and the world hath hated me, because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Uh -huh. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but thou shouldest keep them from the evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So now Jesus is praying for the disciples, not just the 12, but for all those that were following him at the time. And he's saying, Father, sanctify them or set them apart through your word. Your word is truth. Go ahead. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And I've sent them into the world to preach your word just like you sent me into the world, Father. Go ahead. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified through the truth. And for their sakes, to show them an example of how to conduct themselves, I have set myself apart in the word, in your truth, in the gospel. And I've conducted myself perfect in that. I've sanctified myself, so I also want you to sanctify them through the truth. Father, go ahead. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word. And I'm not just praying for them, Father, but I'm praying for Brother Paul, Brother David, Brother Mike, for all the brothers and sisters that are watching this on Brother Paul's feed or Brother Mike's feed or on Friday Night Lights. He's praying for all of us that believe on Jesus through the disciples' word, through having true understanding of the word of the scriptures and being able to look at the new covenant and the new testament and see how they're one and the same. Being set apart through the gospel of Christ Jesus. Go ahead, brother. That they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. And the only way we're one with the Father and with Christ Jesus is if we conduct ourselves in a perfect way according to his gospel, which is the way he conducts himself, it is the way that the kingdom of God is going to be conducted when it comes here. According to the scripture. Go ahead, brother. And the glory which thou gavest me, I have given them, that they may be one, even as we yes, are one. Yes, sir. I and them, and thou and me, that they may be made perfect in one. And we're perfect in the scriptures. We're conducting ourselves exactly the way the Father and his Son do. Go ahead, brother. And that the world may know that thou hast sent me, and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. Amen. Let's continue. Let's go to Romans, the seventh chapter. Romans, the seventh chapter. Paul's writings are often hard to be understood, and they're a little confusing. Let's see what Paul said about the law and resisting temptation. Romans 7 and verse 4. Romans 7 and verse 4. Our beloved brother Paul's take on the law of God. Go ahead, brother. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should walk, I'm sorry, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. So we're dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who was raised from the dead, to Christ Jesus, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. Go ahead, brother. For when we were in the flesh, the motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Because when we were living in the flesh instead of the spirit, we were rocking and rolling any way we wanted to, and we were sinning. We were living in sin. So those that were by the law did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. Everything we were doing, everything we, the way we were conducting ourselves and all those consequences were giving us the second death not eternal life. We were, we were bound for the lake of fire. Go ahead, brother. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in a newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, in other words, we're not under the law anymore. We're under grace, which has allowed us to find out how God wants us to walk and conduct ourselves. So now we're not under the law anymore because now that we're seeing and he's opening our eyes, we're living according to the law. Go ahead, brother. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? So is this law sin? Go ahead. God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust except the law had said that thou shalt not covet. So the law is not sin. God forbid. The law is what opens our eyes to what sin is. Transgression of the law. 
Skip the verse 12 and continue, brother. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Therefore, the law is holy, and the commandment's holy, and just, and good. Because it convicts us when we're living contrary to it, but it saves us when we're walking in it. Go ahead, brother. Was then that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. Uh huh. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. And it's by the commandment that sin becomes exceeding sinful because the more we begin to walk in the gospel of Christ Jesus, the more we begin to see our sinful flesh. And this flesh walks contrary to the spirit, which is the gospel of Christ Jesus. This flesh walks in traditions of men. This flesh walks in whatever it wants to walk in. But once we come and we're striving to see how to conduct ourselves in God's eyes, this law shows us and convicts us that we're sinners. So now it gives us repentance through Christ Jesus, which is to turn from our behavior and to turn into the gospel of Christ Jesus because the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. It's how it's the work that was ordained from the foundation of the world that we should be walking in, sisters and brothers. Tell us where you're at and continue, brother. Uh, 14. Go ahead. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. Yes, sir. For that which I do, I allow not. For that I would, that I do not. But that I hate, that I do. So now Paul is talking about these temptations that come with keeping the law. If the law has been nailed to the cross, we have no temptation. Why is he talking about temptations keeping the law? Because when you walk according to God's commandments, we're cardinal, and this body wants to always take us away from that. And it's through our own lust. Satan might dangle the carrot in front of us, but it's our own lust, the way we used to live, or even when we were growing up in the Word, until we got convicted we need to live in it, the things we were doing, sneaking behind our parents' back and stuff like that. So once we convicted that we need to walk according to God's commandments, Temptation comes in, sisters and brothers. And the things I want to do, I can't do anymore. I want to live some in some of the sinful behaviors I had. I was doing them because they made me feel good or they, or, they, or they brought me some kind of material gain. They made me happy, gave me peace of mind. I can't do those things anymore. But my mind is still taking me back to them. Paul's not saying... Oh, I didn't want to commit adultery with the neighbor's wife, but I went and did it. No, Paul is showing you the struggle that when you're keeping the law, it goes against our nature. Go ahead, brother. If then I do that, which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. So if I'm always being drawn to do the things that I know I shouldn't do, I consent unto the law that it is good because it's the law that strengthens me. It's the obedience to the law that strengthens me because I'm a cardinal man. And living in God's commandments is spiritual, but I still have to live in this cardinal world. So these temptations are still going to come upon me, sisters and brothers. If I was a womanizer, when I come to the Word, now I see I'm not to be a womanizer. But that doesn't mean every time I look at a woman, I'm going to be pure. Those thoughts are going to come in, and i got to kick them out. That's what Paul's talking about here. The things that I would do, I don't. And the things I don't want to do, I do. I don't want to lust after a woman. I want to fear God and keep his commandments. I'm in his book, this, that, and the other. It's 30 below zero, and I see a woman on a bus stop in a fur coat. The only flesh I see is behind the sunglasses, a bit of her eyes, and now I'm lusting after her. My heart is wicked and evil continually. But he, rest assured, he's not talking about giving in to temptation here. He's talking about the fight between the carnal mind and the spiritual mind. Are we done with that? Yes. Let's go to Romans, the fifth chapter. Romans, the fifth chapter. Just back it up a page or so. Romans 5 and verse 21, brother. 5 and 21, go ahead. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life so by now, Christ Jesus our Lord. We've dealt with faith. Faith doesn't replace the law. Jesus came in Galatians 3, and when faith came, that didn't replace the law. In fact, that confirmed the law. So now we're looking at that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's look at this grace. Skip to Romans, the sixth chapter, 
and let's pick it up at verse one, brother. Six and one, go ahead. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So then should we continue in sin so that God could keep giving us chances to come to him? Continue in sin until so that grace might abound? Go ahead, brother. God forbid. How shall we that are in that, that are dead to sin live any longer therein? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Go ahead, brother. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized unto his death? When you're baptized, sisters and brothers, you go under that water. That's killing the old man, the sinful man. When you come up out of that water, you now are supposed to be walking in righteousness according to God's word. Nothing magical and mystical. It's showing God, I understand I can't walk in sin anymore, God, and I need to be keeping your commandments. You come up out of that water, you fear God and keep his commandments. This is Paul on walking, pleasing to God, is what we're reading here. Go ahead, brother. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into, into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so... We also should walk in newness of life. Which is the 66 books in the keeping of the commandments. Go ahead. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection. Uh huh. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. That the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we shall not serve sin. Paul, when he was talking, we were reading about that, that battle between the carnal mind and the spiritual mind. He never gave in to temptation to go sleep with the neighbor's wife, but he had that sinful thought. He had that lust came in, but he didn't serve sin. He didn't go carry it out. He kicked that thought out, replaced it with something godly, and he went about his way because he was a like man and had temptations just like everybody else. But he didn't entertain that thought. He didn't romance or meditate on it. He didn't want to serve sin any longer because he was the new man in Christ. Go ahead, brother. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Because when you're dead, you're freed from the law of sin and death. In other words, now you're under the shed blood of Jesus. You're not paying for your past sins. And now you're walking straight in the gospel of Christ to make sure that you don't go to serve sin anymore. Because you're going to sin inadvertently through ignorance from time to time as you're growing in grace. But we don't have any excuses and there's never a reason. It was our own lust. We fell short. We asked for forgiveness and we keep moving. Go ahead, brother. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. So if we're dead with Christ and we come up and we're keeping his commandments, walking perfect like he did, the Holy One of Israel, we believe we're going to live with him in his kingdom. Go ahead, brother. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead lieth no more, death hath no more dominion over uh -huh. him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Yes, sir. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. And you do that once. You go in the water, you die, you come up out of that water a new man, you know how to walk, you start keeping the Sabbath day, the feast days, the dietary law, all the things God commanded, and you grow in grace. And as he reveals more, then you respond, and you repent, and you respond according to the word. Go ahead, brother. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. You're not going to let sin reign in your mortal body. In other words, you're not going to have anything to do with sin. You're going to prove all things, abstain from all appearance of evil. You're going to get it out of your gate. Go ahead, brother. That you should obey it in the lust thereof. And you're not going to obey it in the lust thereof. You're going to kick it to the curb. Go ahead, brother. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but and yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead. Yes, sir. And your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. In verse 13, he's just saying, don't be a sinner anymore. For now on, do what's pleasing in God's eyes. Go ahead. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. So sin shall not have dominion over you, because you're not under the law anymore. You're not breaking the law anymore. You're under grace. God is opening your eyes on how to serve him, and you're responding, and you're repenting, and you're turning from it. He showed you Saturday was the seventh-day Sabbath, the salvation. You stopped going to church on Sunday. He showed you you shouldn't eat pork. You stopped eating it. He started showing you certain things in your behavior that you needed to walk with the fruits of the Spirit. You started trying to conduct yourself that way. You're walking to the best of your ability to the way God would have you walk. You're not going towards sin anymore. So you're not yielding yourself to sin. You're yielding yourself to righteousness. Go ahead. 
What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law anymore, but we're under grace? God forbid. God forbid. Go ahead, brother. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey his servants, ye are whom to whom ye are ye obey. Remember what grace was all about. It was the opportunity to come to him. And it's whoever you are servants that you obey, or masters that you obey, you're their servant. So you either obey God and his word to righteousness or Satan and his world to damnation. Go ahead, brother. Whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto unrighteousness. Yes, sir. But God be thanked that you were the servant of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. And we already read in 2 Timothy what that form of doctrine was. It was the scriptures that you've learned from a child that were able to make you wise into salvation through faith that is in Christ Jesus. Belief turns into obedience. Go ahead, brother. Being then made free from sin, you became the servants of unrighteousness. And being made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness right. through God's word. Go ahead, brother. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members, servants unto uncleanness and to iniquity, unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, servants to righteousness and unto holiness. And just like you used to be quick to run to sin, be quick to run to righteousness now, because you're the new man. Go ahead. For when you were the servants of sin, you were freed from unrighteousness. Yes, sir. What fruit had ye in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For as the end of those things is death. So now when the law opened your eyes to what was sin in God's eyes and how you were sinning against him or spitting in his face, when you come to him and you're walking in righteousness, you're ashamed of some of the ways you used to conduct yourself. Go ahead, brother. But now being made free from sin and become servants to God, ye have your fruit unto holiness and the everlasting life. But now you're conducting yourself in a way that's holy in God's eyes and you have a shot at the kingdom. Go ahead. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because the wages of breaking God's commandments are death, but the gift of God, His grace, is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's continue. Let's go to Romans, I mean Hebrews, the 11th chapter. Hebrews, the 11th chapter. Hebrews 11. Let's see what true faith is, sisters and brothers. Instead of just listening to me and reading some scriptures that faith is belief and belief is faith. Let's see what true faith is. Everybody goes here. Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11 and... Let's pick it up at verse 1, brother. 11 and 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. So faith is the substance of things not hopeful, of, the, of things hoped for, and the evidence of things not seen. So our faith, we've never seen Jesus or any of the disciples or anything. All we've got is this book. So we haven't seen any of these things, but we're hoping for them because we're convicted through his word. Because we know that it, that's what his word does. It's a two-edged sword. It shows the intensity of thoughts of the man's heart. So if you really have a heart for God, you start reading his word, you start getting convicted in the way you're walking. And you turn from that, and you start conducting yourself according to this. So it's the evidence of things not seen. Go ahead. For by it, the elders obtained a good report. And that's how the elders obtained a good report. They had faith in the scriptures. Go ahead. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen we're not made of things which do appear. And through our faith, we understand that Christ Jesus is the one that created the word, uh, the world. Because it's through his word we get that understanding. Skip down to verse 6 and continue, brother. But without faith, it is impossible to please but him. But without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. I thought him. we were finally going to get away from that belief. But we didn't. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And when you diligently seek him, you become obedient to his word. Let's go to James, the second chapter. James, the second chapter. James 2. James 2. And brother, we're going to pick it up at verse 17. James 2 and verse 17. Would you get there, brother? Go ahead. Even so, faith, if it hath not works, is dead being alone. Even so, faith, if it doesn't have works, it's dead by itself. 
You can believe all you want. If I don't flip that light switch on, it's dead. It doesn't turn the light on for me. Faith in God without works doesn't get you into the kingdom. Go ahead, brother. Yea, a man may say, thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works. That's impossible to do. You can't show your belief without your works. Go ahead. And I will show thee my faith by my works. I gotta flip the switch on to get the light to come on to show my faith. Go ahead, brother. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. Uh-huh. The devils also believe and tremble. You but believe that there's God, you do well. But guess what? Satan believes and he trembles and he's going in the fire. Because he was disobedient to God's word. So if you believe, you do well. Go ahead. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? But will you know, O vain man, and we're all O vain men and women. Man means mankind. But wilt thou know, O vain man, that faith without works is dead? Faith in that light without flipping the switch doesn't mean anything. Go ahead. Was Abraham our father not justified by works when he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar? Uh-huh. Seest thou how faith wrought with his works, and by his works was faith made perfect? Well, how was his faith made perfect through his works? He was obedient to the way God told him to conduct himself. And when he conducted himself in the ways of God, God's ways make us perfect. Go ahead, brother. And the scripture was fulfilled, which says, Abraham believed God, and it was imputed unto him for righteousness. Yes, sir. And he was called the friend of God. Yes, sir. Ye see then how that by his by works a man is justified and not by faith alone. By works a man is justified and not by faith or belief alone. I gotta flip that light switch to show my faith. Go ahead, brother. Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she had received the messengers and had sent them out another way? Would she be had would she have been justified if she would have turned them in? No. Go ahead, brother. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. Let's go to Hebrews, the third chapter. Let's look at this a little more closely. Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3. Hebrews, the third chapter. Let's look at the kingdom of God, faith without works. God always gives us a physical to show us the spiritual, sisters and brothers. Hebrews, the third chapter, and let's pick it up at verse 5, brother. 3 and 5. Go ahead. And Moses verily was faithful in all his house as a servant for the testimony of those things which were to be spoken after. Uh-huh. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we? We are. I'm sorry. Whose house are are we if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end so moses was a faith was faithful in all his house as a servant and oh that was a testimony for the things where were to be spoken after about christ jesus because jesus said that you had to conduct yourself a, a certain way to make his kingdom you have to conduct yourself a certain way and moses was barely faithful in all his house as a servant Moses is in the kingdom. We even have a vision in, in the New Covenant, the New Testament, that shows you Moses is in the kingdom. Go ahead, brother. Wherefore, as the Holy Ghost saith, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the, prov as in the provocation uh -huh. in the day of temptation in the wilderness. When your fathers tempted me, proved me, and saw my works forty years. And so now we're supposed to, as the Holy Ghost said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation in the day of the temptation in the wilderness when they were moved by the Holy Ghost, but hardened their hearts. If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm until the end, sisters and brothers, they received it. They didn't hold fast the confidence. They fell short in God's eyes and they weren't allowed to see the promised land or the land of Israel. Joshua and the children ended up going in. Go ahead and continue, brother. Wherefore, I was grieved with that generation, and said, They do alway err in their heart, and they have not known my ways. They have always erred in their hearts and have not known my ways. In other words, I'm teaching them, but they're not listening. They're not conducting themselves the way I'm asking them to. Go ahead, brother. So I swear in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. So I swear in my wrath, they weren't going to enter into my rest. They weren't going into the land of Jerusalem, to the land of Israel, to the city of Jerusalem. They weren't going there. Go ahead, brother. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief 
and departing from the living God. So use this physical as an example of how you're supposed to conduct yourself. Take heed that you don't depart from the living God like they did. Go ahead, brother. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. Uh huh. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast unto the end. See, Israel didn't do that. They didn't hold fast their confidence to the end. They fell short, and the Lord didn't allow them to see the kingdom. That's This is the physical, and we're going to look at the spiritual in a minute. Go ahead, brother. While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Uh -huh. But with whom was he grieved 40 years? Was it not them that had sinned, whose carcasses fell in the wilderness? Well, hold on, brother. Did you skip verse 16? Go back to 15 and pick it back oh, up to 15. I did skip 16. Go My ahead. Apologies. That's While fine. it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts as in the provocation. When For, they hardened their hearts and fell short in the wilderness and didn't make it into the promised land. Go ahead. For some, when they heard, did provoke, howbeit not all that came out of Egypt by Moses. And some, when they heard it, did provoke. Go ahead. But with whom he was grieved, was he grieved 40 years? Was it not them that had sinned, whose carcasses had fell in the wilderness? But he was grieved with those that were sinning, and their carcasses fell in the wilderness. They didn't make it to the promised land. Moses was one of those. Go ahead, brother. And to whom swear he that they should not enter into his rest, but to them that believed not? And he said that those that did not enter into his rest weren't going to go into it, not those that believed not. Go ahead, brother. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. So we see that they could not enter in because of unbelief. He swore unto them they would not enter into their rest because they didn't believe, sisters and brothers. They believed not. So they could not enter in to the promised land because of a lack of faith or a lack of belief. This is the spiritual to show us the physical. Let's go to Hebrews, the fourth chapter, and pick it up at verse 1. 4 and 1, brother, go ahead. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest any of you should seem to come short of it so let us therefore fear lest we come short and what did paul tell us to do for unto us was hang on brother what did paul told us to seek our own salvation through fear and trembling so let us therefore fear left any a promise being left us of us not entering into his rest any of us should seem to come short of it go ahead brother for unto us was the gospel preached, uh -huh. as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with the faith in them that had heard it. For unto us was the gospel preached, as well as unto them. Remember, sisters and brothers, they're living the New Testament. What they're reading is the scriptures. It's the scriptures that our salvation lies in. The New Testament is a testimony of the old. Go ahead, brother. For which, which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. So we have those that heard it, but when they heard it, they didn't have the belief or the faith. It wasn't mixed with faith in what they heard. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, Although the works were finished from the foundation of the world, sisters and brothers, these works that bring us into the kingdom of God start with those Ten Commandments. Go ahead, brother. For he spake in a certain place on the seventh day on this wise, and God did rest the seventh day from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. So now he's showing you the physical, the going into the land, the promised land. Now he's starting to show you the spiritual. And he's telling you that some of those didn't enter in because of unbelief. But there is still a day of rest. The seventh day, God rested from all his works. And in this place again, if they shall enter into my rest, there's still a day of rest that's coming. That physical promised land or that rest that they didn't get those that died in the wilderness was something that was pointing it was a shadow of things pointing to that seventh day rest the kingdom of christ jesus go tell us where you're at and continue brother verse seven yes sir again he limited a certain day saying in david 
Today, after so long a time, as it is said, today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts. For if Jesus had given them rest, then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? Uh -huh. There remaineth, therefore, a rest to the people therefore of God. Therefore remaineth the rest to the people of God, sisters and brothers, and that's what we're laboring for. Go ahead. For he that has entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works, as God did from his. And those that enter into his rest have ceased from their own works, as God did to his. God ended his works. He rested the seventh day. When we take hold of the covenant, when we end our works, when we endure until the end, either we go to sleep or Jesus returns, then we have ended our labor. Go ahead, brother. Let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest, lest any man should fall after the same example of unbelief. And let us labor, therefore, to enter into that rest that we don't fall like they did in the wilderness and not make the promised land. Because if we sin like they did, using them as our example, we're not going to make the kingdom of Christ Jesus. And if we don't make that kingdom of Christ Jesus, we're not going to make the Father's kingdom. Those of us that have understanding. And that's what we're trying to do with lessons like this, is draw those of you that don't have understanding into the gospel of Christ so that you can have an opportunity to save yourselves. Go ahead and continue, brother. Uh, that was good. We're done with that? Yes. Let's go to Proverbs, the 24th chapter. So God always gives us the physical to show us the spiritual. The physical was the, was God leaving, leading Israel through the wilderness to show us the spiritual, being alive in this flesh and striving for the kingdom of God. Proverbs, the 24th chapter. Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24. And brother, we're going to pick it up at verse 12. Proverbs 24 and verse 12. Let's look how Jesus is going to use righteous judgment. Go ahead, brother. If thou sayest, Behold, we knew it not, doth not he that pondereth the heart consider it? Doesn't Jesus ponder the hearts? Isn't he going to consider it if you say, Well, I didn't know, Lord. Go ahead. And he that keepeth thy soul, doth he not know it? Uh-huh. Shall, shall not he render to every man according to his works? Shall not Jesus render to every man according to his works? Faith without works is dead, sisters and brothers. We've gone through great lengths in a lot of Paul's writings to show you what Paul really meant when he was bringing the Gentiles that gospel of salvation. Let's go back to Ecclesiastes, the 12th chapter. Ecclesiastes, the 12th chapter. Ecclesiastes 12. Ecclesiastes 12. And we're going to read one verse. Ecclesiastes, or we're going to read two verses. 12, pick it up at verse 13, brother. Go ahead. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Uh -huh. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of so man. So that's the whole duty of man. Go ahead. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. For God shall bring every work into judgment whether every, with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Go to John, the fifth chapter. Gospel of John, the fifth chapter. John 5. John 5. And brother, let's pick it up at verse 26. 5 and 26. Go ahead. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself. Uh huh. And hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. So he has judgment to ex or authority to execute judgment, because he's the Son of Man, Christ Jesus. Go ahead. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming in, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his and voice. And don't marvel at this, that he's got all power and execute all judgment, because the time's coming that all that are dead are going to hear his voice. Go ahead. And shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. Uh huh. I can, of my own self, do nothing as I hear. I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Jesus perfect in every sense of the word. Man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. His judgment isn't even his. His judgment is the fathers that sent him. Let's go to Matthew, the 16th chapter. Matthew, the 16th chapter. Matthew 16. Matthew 16. 
And let's pick it up at verse 27, brother. 16 and 27. Go ahead. For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then shall he reward every man according to his works. Going to reward every man according to his works. Let's go to 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. 2 Corinthians, the 11th chapter. 2 Corinthians 11. And brother, let's pick it up at verse 13. What about all those preaching against God's word? What about all those false prophets that the book defines? Go ahead, brother. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. Uh-huh. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. He used to be the light bringer. He used to be what Gabriel does now, the Holy Spirit. Go ahead, brother. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness, uh -huh. whose end shall be according to their work. Even the false prophets are going to be judged according to their works. Let's go look how this judgment takes place. Let's go to Revelation, the 20th chapter. Revelation, the 20th chapter. Revelation 20. Revelation 20. Sisters and brothers, let's pick it up at verse 12. 20 and 12. Go ahead, brother. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the books were opened, which are the books in front of you, these 66. And then there's a book of life. And the book of life is one that God created that he keeps in heaven with him right now till Jesus returns. That has all his servants' names written in it. Go ahead, brother. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And they were judged by the things written in the books according to their works. Go ahead, brother. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And every man's judged according to his works, using God's word as the standard for judgment. Go ahead, brother. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And death and hell are cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. In other words, Jesus is standing there and he goes, you're worthy right this way. Well done and faithful servant. Be gone, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Lake of fire. Next. Well done, my good and faithful servant. And this goes on for the whole line. Go ahead, brother. And whosoever was not found written into the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. We have lessons on the book of life, sisters and brothers, on our YouTube pages. You can go uh, that on your own. Precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. One precept always rolls into another. But if we don't stay on line, on focus with the precept that we're dealing with, it's easy to get off track and fall into false doctrine. So we have lessons on the book of life online. Let's continue with faith without works is dead. Let's go to Revelation, the 22nd chapter. Last chapter in the Bible, Revelation 22, and we're going to pick it up at verse 12, brother, 22 and 12. Go ahead. And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according to as his work shall be. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. Your mother, your father, your son, your daughter, that righteousness can't save you. God's looking at you. Are you going to go in the fire and watch them rejoicing, or are you going to repent and turn to him? Go ahead, brother. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. The author and finisher of our faith. Go ahead. Blessed are they that do his commandments. Blessed are they that do his commandments. That they may have right to the tree of life. That they may have right to the tree of life. And may enter in through the gates into the city. And enter into the kingdom. Go ahead, brother. But without our dogs and Without sorcerers, our homosexuals and all those sorcerers, go ahead. And whoremongers and murderers. Fornicators and killers, go ahead. Idolaters and whatsoever loveth and maketh the lie. Idolaters and every, all them people that love and makes all them lies and, and trying to step on people to get ahead and all those, go ahead. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these I, things Jesus, in the churches. I, Jesus, have sent my Holy Spirit to testify unto you these things in the churches. Go ahead, brother. I am the root and the offspring of David. And the bright and morning star. Yes, sir. That's good. Let's continue. Let's go to 1 Peter, the first chapter. 1 Peter, the first chapter. I could keep reading. and we'd, we'd, we'd go right back to Genesis and just keep reading. 1 Peter, the first chapter. We're looking at now how to conduct ourselves to make it on the right side of the kingdom. 
to be righteous in God's eyes, to hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter 1, and brother, we're going to pick this up at verse 13. 1 Peter 1 and verse 13, go ahead. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and hope to the end the reward that Jesus is bringing when he returns, that you're a partaker of it. And the psalm says that God takes pleasure in those that fear him and hope for his reward. Go ahead, brother. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance. As obedient children, not the way you used to be before you repented, when you found out in God's word how to conduct yourself, when God shed his grace upon you, because you now began to have belief in his gospel. Go ahead. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. But as the Father that has drawn you through Jesus is holy, be holy in all manner of conversations, just like Jesus and the Father are. Go ahead. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Go ahead, brother. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, past the time of your sojourning here in fear, uh -huh. for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation, received by tr the traditions of your fathers. So when you call on the Father, who doesn't have any respect of persons, and he's looking at you, whether you're even righteous to be heard, because the prayers of the wicked are an abomination in God's eyes, he doesn't hear those. So if you're wicked in his eyes he's not listening but if you're righteous in his eyes he's hearing you and he's not a respecter of persons he was going to kill moses after he sent him to, to pull the nation of israel out of egypt because he didn't obey his voice so god's not a respecter of persons you better pass your time here with fear sisters and brothers because we weren't redeemed with those false doctrines passed down by our Parents, Sunday worship, Easter Sunday, Christmas, nothing to do with God, nothing to do with Jesus. Easy to prove if you want to know the truth. Go ahead, brother. But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. But your faith in Christ Jesus, in his precious blood, that Passover lamb without spot and blemish, your faith in his blood, which because, which is belief and becomes obedience is what brings you under his blood. Go ahead, brother. Who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. And he was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but he was manifest in these last days for us. Go ahead. Who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. And it's who by Jesus we believe in God and we're our, that our faith and glory might be in the Father. Go ahead, brother. Seeing you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. And since we purified our souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit or the Word of God unto unfeigned love of the brethren, love one another with a pure heart and do it fervently. You find out somebody within the church needs a hand, you go, you get the call of brothers and sisters, hey, we got somebody needs some help here. You find out somebody's rejoicing, hey, we got this great party we need to throw. One mind, one spirit taking care of each other. Tell us where you're at, continue, brother. 23. Yes, Being sir. born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And in this flesh, we're born again, because that old man has died when he got baptized, the one that served sin, and that new man's come up. In this flesh, we're born again by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. But to truly be born again is when we get that spiritual change. Go ahead, brother. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth, and the flowers thereof falleth away. Uh -huh. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. And everything's gonna wax old and, and it's, gonna, it's gonna rust away, it's gonna fade away. But the word of God endures forever. And it's this word 
that by this gospel of these 66 books is preached unto you and is preached unto all you that hear it today. The word that Paul, the word that Peter was preaching, the word that Moses and all the prophets were teaching and, and, and bringing is exactly what we've been reading. Let's continue. Let's go to Genesis, the 26th chapter. We dealt quite a bit with Abram and Abraham. Let's see how he was made perfect. Genesis 26. Genesis 26. We read about the faith of Abraham, how he, his, his works made him perfect. Let's get another witness to that. Genesis 26, and pick it up at verse 1, brother. This is Father Abraham, sisters and brothers. Go ahead. And there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. Uh -huh. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee. For unto thee and unto thy seed will I give all these countries, and will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. So now he's talking to Isaac, and he's saying, I'm going to continue the oath or the covenant that I made with your father. And I'm going to tell you why I'm going to do that. Go ahead, brother. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto, unto thy seed all these countries. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. And it's in your seed that I'm going to come through, Mary, and I'm going to become flesh, and I'm going to bless all nations as the Passover sacrifice. Go ahead, brother. Because the Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge and commandments, my statutes and my laws. Because your father Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes and my laws. Father Abraham, the father of the faithful, was obedient to the commandments of God. Let's go to John, the 14th chapter. Gospel of John, the 14th chapter. John 14, and we have one other place after this. John 14, John 14, one verse and we're going to skip. Verse 15, brother. If you love me, keep my commandments. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Which ones? The same ones he gave to Israel through Moses on the mount. And then, before he gave them to Moses, first he spoke them directly to Israel. And he said that he was merciful to thousands of those that love him and keep his commandments. Then he came in the flesh and he said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Skip down to 21 and continue, brother. He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. He that has my commandments and keeps them, it's him that loves me. Go ahead. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my father, and I will love him and will manifest myself to him. And he that loves me will be loved of my father. And we're going to come and we're going to live with you. Go ahead. Judas saith unto him, not an Iscariot, Lord, how, it, how is it? that thou wilt manifest thyself unto us, and not unto the world. Uh -huh. Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. So Judas, not Iscariot, said, Lord, how are you going to manifest yourself unto us, but not the rest of the world? And Jesus says, If a land, man loves me, he will keep my words. And then the father and I are going to come, and we're going to bring him into our kingdom. Go ahead, brother. He that loveth me and keepeth not my sayings. But he that loveth me and keepeth not my sayings. Go ahead. The word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. And the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's which has sent me. So if you don't love me, you're not going to keep my sayings. But if you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. Let's go to the last place, Galatians, the third chapter. Galatians, the third chapter. Remember Abram? God said, walk before me and be thou perfect, and then I'm going to make a covenant with you. Remember Abraham, what the Lord told Isaac? Because Abraham kept all my commandments, statutes, judgments, and laws, I'm going to continue the covenant with you. Talked a lot about becoming a part of the commonwealth of Israel. We have lessons that show you how to do that. Sisters and brothers, precept upon precept, we can't let one roll into the other one, or we'll never get understanding of the one we're dealing with. And we'll be here all night jumping from precept to precept. That's why each Sabbath or each lesson that we do, we stay on that precept. And we go here a little and there a little, reading the scriptures straight through, staying on that precept to get understanding of that precept.
like we did today. Faith without works is dead. We stayed on that precept. We were all over the Bible, reading it straight through, everything that the Lord had to do that he writ, had written, that he wrote to give to us to understand that our belief without showing it by being pleasing to God is vanity and it's fruitless. Let's end it here. Galatians 3 and verse 28, brother. Go ahead. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female, for ye are all one in Jesus Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, bond nor free, male nor female. We're all one in Christ Jesus. Go ahead. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. And if ye be Christ, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise, because you will be keeping all of God's commandments, statutes, laws, and judgments, just like Father Abraham did. So, sisters and brothers, that was faith without works is dead. Anybody ever has any questions, you can come up now after the lesson and ask them, or you can reach us, fotspm at gmail.com, Friday Night Lights 1315 at gmail.com. Faith Without Works is Dead, sisters and brothers, as always, we thank you for the opportunity to rightly divide God's word and hope you got something from these scriptures.